morning and welcome to Rootless Reproducible and Somatic. I am very sad to say that my co-presenter Pi is not able to make it today, but she is with us in spirits. And uh, let's go. Hi, I'm Andy, I'm from Control Plane. I'm a lover of all things grateful. You could say I'm a build fanatic and an advocate of continuous everything. I'm a founder of Control Plane which is continuous infrastructure engineering practices with focus on Kubernetes and container security. And I want to talk about containerized builds and how to attack them. And of course, try to defend them as well. So we're going to talk about building stuff. Building stuff that we can trust, some source material that we have no way of trusting far from the table. So, how much stuff can I cram into 20 or 30 minutes, I hear you ask. Well, with this uh, cloudy Seattle Cinemagraph, we want to talk about the properties of safe OCI build systems, attacking them, a look at the current tooling, and how to secure untrusted builds. And with regards to containers in general, Liz White spoke about this at her beautiful keynote a year ago, Copenhagen, just for us, writing about this since Docker emerged. What is the heinous root of all evil? The root of all evil is unnecessarily running processes as root. And here we see an indication of crack cloud gods. So, what does this mean? Running as root is not a vulnerable configuration in itself, but it provides a marvelous pivot point if any other layer of heinous defenses is breached. Like the privilege flag, by sharing namespaces, folks in the kernel. This is why privilege is so bad. We can see root was a prerequisite for the recent run C container breakouts. So we want everything to be rootless, both inside the container with defensive depth and to mitigate the lack of user namespaces, but also outside our container. Our container runtime should not be privileged in case of container breakouts. And if we are running our container runtime as root, the inmates are running in the asylum. So we're talking about Docker D, Container D, Run C, all enabling the execution of untrusted code, but running as the root user on the host. We want everything to be rootless. That means it doesn't require access to a root owned daemon on the host, or ideally any root privilege at all. And this is useful for building untrusted images, for example, in a cloud and a platform as a service environment. And importantly, defending against malicious supply chain components. Building without a root user also protects us from a class of privilege escalation attacks. Of course, everything in Linux is a file, and discretionary access control to those files is specified by users and groups. So running inside the container as root without a user namespace means that any other namespaces that are disabled move that user closer and closer to being grouped on the host. Some build tools will create a user namespace to get around this problem. Others go to great lengths to avoid doing so. So, What's the big deal about user namespaces? They are perennial Linux kernel security frontier. And a super difficult piece of kernel code to write due to so many touch points in so many places. In a user namespace, user IDs in the guest map different user IDs on the host. Just like a kid namespace, which we are transparently shifting to give the impression of a different user table. Root in the user namespace has UID zero and full capabilities, but obvious restrictions apply. Root can of course be mapped for any user on the host, and unprivileged users map only their own user and group to either themselves or root. And uh, my personal projection of white knight syndrome, the shift MS patch set that has languished on the Linux kernel mailing list for many years has been reignited. The canonical LXC team have picked up this patch set and run with it. This will allow dynamic remapping of user IDs, similar to user namespaces, but at the file system level. A different approach, different 
compromises. It's super exciting. So, that's why we want ruthlessness. Now, what about reproducibility? We want reproducibility to stop people tampering with our build artifacts. There have been real life compiler attacks, like Xcode Ghost, an attack on the Xcode IDE that embedded malware in the compiled outputs. That malware enabled remote access and control over compiled artifacts that were then distributed to users. And the Win32 production virus altered the Delphi compiler's output binaries with botnet enabling code. This may sound familiar, and the fix for this class of attacks and some other problems reproducible builds. A build is reproducible if and only if given the same source code, build environment, and build instructions, any party recreates bit by bit identical copies of all the output artifacts. So let's start with operating systems. Compiling the same package in two different locations has for many years meant non-binary identical outputs. This build time non-determinism makes reflections on trusting trusts, the seminal security paper, difficult to disprove. The premise being that if we don't trust our build tools, we don't trust their output. Projects like Debian have been moving towards fully reproducible builds for all of their packages. This creates an independently verifiable path from binary to source, sorry, from source to binary code. There's a lot of work going on at the distribution level, and we want to be able to extend that work into container images. An open source software that we pull from less trusted sources like NPM, Maven Central, et al, and especially compiled binary artifacts. The ultimate goal here is to be able to run the same build in different locations and get the exact same output. This is fundamentally a question of trust. From our build environments, through our tools and the output software, the packages and the libraries that are consumed in the build and runtime of the system, and this trust goes all the way back to the identity of the user committing changes to the lines of code in your source repo. But what happens if, like Ken, we do not trust our build tools and supply chain? Well, we can rebuild the same package in multiple locations. If our builds are deterministic and reproducible, we can hash and sign the outputs and compare them to other builds. Any non-matching builds are then subject to scrutiny. Attacking this system requires either a shared supply chain attack or an individual assault on each and every node in the build system raising the expense of the attack quite significantly. This is an independent verification of trust in the things that we're concerned with, the build tool and the artifacts that it produces, and this process significantly de-risks that component of our supply chain. Combined with tooling such as InToto, which Debian uses as the basis for their reproducible build signing, this requires GPG signatures for each stage of a build. We can run duplicate distributed builds, verify all of our output signatures, and check that the code is built correctly, and to give us some certainty that our build environments have not been compromised, or that they are all equally compromised. So, to achieve this property of reproducibility for OCI images, we require local or pin dependencies, no non-deterministic network calls, or any non-determinism in general, and of course, an identical product every time. No time-based outputs, identical output ordering, ultimately bit-for-bit -bit similarity. Signable and tamper-proof outputs. Of course, the OCI image is addressed by a SHA-256 of its contents we can easily see when any of these conditions are unmet in an individual OCI build. However, non-deterministic actions like network calls can't be identified, in, excuse me, can't be identified in Docker run commands. And so require a user to add things like hash validation for downloads that will fail the build on incorrect values. And essentially trick the Docker image cache into being reproducible. Speaking of Docker images, a brief diversion onto OCI v2. The version one spec is a tad ropey in places. 
It was derived from the state of the tooling written in Golang um, as of the version it was released in and includes some bugs from that version of the language. OCI version 2 is underway and contains some nifty fixes, not only for reproducibility, but also rolling hashes for better image caching and content distribution. Watch that space, especially for Brandon Lum's encrypted image layers proposal. Uh, there are links at the end of the talk. And on to the final property, hermitism, related to the practice of hermitage, seclusion, isolation, and independence. In container terms, our builds should not impact each other, they should not leak state, or indeed be knowable by another build. And we shouldn't rely on anything outside of the build context. Hermitism also makes running, uh, sorry, building images in multi-tenanted environments practical. This means we can share build farms across projects with similar trust boundaries and reduce the cost of running many build workers and generally reducing CI cycle time. Okay, so how do we attack a build? If the Docker file is untrusted, malicious commands in the run directive can attack the host. They can attack things on the host's non-loopback network ports and services. They can enumerate other network entities, the cloud provider, build infrastructure, routes to other services, metadata APIs. Or, despite a trusted Docker file, a malicious or compromised image specified in the from directive has access to any build secrets that are added or pulled in, mounted uh, into that image at runtime, at build time, sorry. Or a malicious image has a nefarious on-build directive. Happily, they are less used these days, but nevertheless, it's arbitrary code execution in a descendant image. Or with Docker in Docker, we can get to the host as we're running in a privileged container, which, as we know, turns off setcom, app armor, capabilities, all the namespaces, and leaves us running as close to the host as we could possibly be. And of course, we can get out of a container in all the traditional ways by attacking the kernel. So, to protect our builds, what do we do? We can prevent network or internet-bound egress. Why is this needed anyway? It's better to pull our dependencies pre-build or from a local repository so we know that they won't change and we're de-risked from a remote outage affecting our deployments. We can isolate ourselves from the host's kernel. VMs are not really the essence of containerization, but nevertheless, this is how our cloud providers run our, via, uh, run our container images anyway. We can run run commands with directives inside the Docker file as a non-root user in the builds file system. We don't want access to the Docker socket or to change global state in a container. And finally, we can run build processes as a non-root user or in a user namespace. This prevents leakage of UID privileges from the host we should be, as always, in as many namespaces as possible. So, do you want to get burned? This is where you can get burned. I will just leave these here for posterity. Uh, these slides will go up um, on Twitter shortly afterwards and, of course, on uh, the Shed uh, webpage too. So, with that said, let's compare some build tooling. Okay, Docker build version 2 is called BuildKit. And amongst a host of useful features, including sequence mounting, it can run rootless. Thanks to Akihiro Suda, who is speaking right now. In fact, I recommend that you watch his talk uh, when, they're, when they're published. This protects the system from a potential class of bugs in BuildKit or ContainerD or RunC. That rootlessness uses rootless kit, which is Akihiro's project, a build of Linux native fake root emulator. And everything, including BuildKit, can run inside a user namespace. This, as we will see with many others, requires a set UID binary for apt, which is typically very poor practice because that means that even though the binary is invoked by an unprivileged user, it is set to root when it's run. And if we can trick apt into running arbitrary code, then we've escalated our privilege to root. So it's not the nicest story, but the compromises here are we're protecting ourselves from all these other attacks instead. And this is a trick that, as I say, many other of these build tools require. You're probably using it already. It is integrated with Docker from version 1806, 
and it can run as a standalone daemon. Rootless build kit can be executed in Kubernetes. Courtesy of proc mount in the security context pod security policy, this allows paths in proc to not be masked, which build kit uses to spin up nested containers. What that means is some things in containers are still shared with the host, but we have a virtual overlay, uh, a file system perception overlay almost, which means that we, when we access certain parts in proc, our container runtime gives us fake values so that we're isolated from directly meddling with the host kernel, essentially. Unmasking proc gives us some namespace busting superpowers. So again, there are compromises in some of these mechanisms. Everything, of course, is balanced based on your threat model. It is also likely to derive an entitlement mode inspired by Moby entitlements, which will allow fine-grained permissions around run commands in the Docker file, which is super nice. And finally, it has an optimized parallel step runner that is unique for OCI builders as far as I'm aware. On to Jess Fraz's image, or IMG. This is a derivative of BuildKit that re-implements a number of the BuildKit interfaces to be unprivileged. It still requires set UID binaries, as does BuildKit, and a lot of work is just done here to run apt. Uh, because of course, apt is installing things, that is a root level operation. Uh, in this case, it allows sets of subordinate user and group IDs. Um, these are all quite nicely documented in the repos if you want to poke around there. And as you might expect, it goes all out with namespaces and set comp. And as it's using a user namespace, it is fully unprivileged on the host. Nice. LXC has an honorable mention as it is the old faithful of container runtimes, powering the first version of Docker and still used extensively across the Ubuntu estate. Despite using a different image format, it actually supports OCI containers via a dedicated script. If you use LXC with this script, you can run OCI containers fully rootless. Not proliferated much, but damn cool. Umochi is one of the original OCI manipulation tools and takes a different approach to everything so far. It's built by a run C and kernel maintainer called Alexis Sarai and uses some funky tricks to simulate rootfulness. In fact, he's, uh, the fact he's a run C maintainer means rootless features required to get this project to work have been ported back upstream into run C. And again, this is a sort of three or four year labor of love from uh, a small pool of developers for which we must be eternally grateful. Uh, Yumochi is rootless, and it doesn't require any special file systems to be rootless. It currently doesn't use any kernel namespacing. It's all VFS-based, and it should be noted that a lot of tooling in this space operates by recursively choning a directory. This is quite a lot of overhead, and Yumochi uses an extended file attribute to get around this particular overhead. It is a component of a wider build tool and may be extended shortly to include its own builder. Watch that space. Kaneko is probably one that you have all heard about. It's a relatively new tool. It is used as the back end for Knative build and it targets a number of different build modes, notably Kubernetes. It does not depend on a Docker daemon and instead starts a container using one of the noted modes. It does, however, use the root user inside the container. This is required so it has permission to unpack an image and extract that tarball into the file system. Then also the ability to run Docker file run directives as the root user. This opens it up to some of the issues mentioned previously. I don't know whether Kaneko is vulnerable to the recent run CCVE. Um, I'd love to talk to you if anyone here works on Kaneko. And there is an open issue to do with hardening against malicious from containers, uh, from images, which is a little niche, but it's a good sign when people are reporting uh, the high crowning fruit, fruit because the low dangling items have already been dealt with. So really nice solution and uh, great to see the innovation in this space. Builder is Red Hat's answer to Docker build. It can run in various modes with the rootless mode being preferable for our use case. Slurp for NetNS is an interesting addition. This is more work from Alexa, the run C maintainer, 
and Akihiro, the build kit maintainer, uh, or one of them. So networking engineer, sorry, networking operations are privileged. And in order to bypass the requirement for Root to interact with these long established networking capabilities, Slurp creates a dedicated TAP interface for network namespaces. It's a lot faster than the alternatives and is seeing general adoption in the land of rootlessness. Of course, this is all part of Red Hat's uh, movement to move Docker as far away from its estate as possible. And in fact, as we progress into the recent modern versions of RHEL, we will see no Docker anywhere. Makisu is Uber's approach to these requirements. It is similar to Kaneko in that it runs inside an unprivileged container somewhere, but it goes to great lengths to ensure cacheability. It runs Redis for distributed caching, so it is designed to operate at huge scale, and it provides local caching options too, including expiration and the hash bank commit annotation. So Uber have extended the Docker file syntax somewhat to give them massively distributed and parallelized caching Again, uh, is a nice approach. Another uh, Google tool in here, as Kaneko was. Um, if any of you have tried to use Basel, it is uh, academically perfect. Um, from a user experience, it is far more difficult to interact with. It has much hermetism, but at great cost. Run commands do not exist. And there is much hoopla, consternation, wailing, gnashing of teeth online about this. Basel fulfills these requirements admirably in that it can build almost anything and do so deterministically, but at the cost of usability, which is always high with Basel, and this is a great shame as it can build practically anything thrown at it. And a hosted tool now, again, deeply isolated, very hermetic, and here is an option but probably not a usable build target for organizations with the kind of security requirements that really care about secure container builds. For everybody else, Cloud Build's great. There is even a Jenkins plugin for those of us that can't escape his looming specter. And of course, it's reliant on the cloud provider security model, which is not always fully disclosed. Uh, so, do these fulfill our requirements? Everybody can achieve rootlessness today thanks to work shipped over the last couple of years, especially in Run-C, but implementation-specific caveats abound. No build tools are fully unreproducible and fallible by design. Output is a function of run behavior, and as such, only Basel really achieves this without diligent use of the run directive. We can still put non-deterministic behavior into those directives, which mean the reproducible element of these builds is compromised. Everything has a varying degree of hermeticism, but nothing is absolute. We may well need VMs to achieve full isolation and lockdown right now. But why choose only one? Akihiro has a container builder interface to abstract building. So. Uh, which I, oh yes, sorry, here we are. Uh, yep, so this, this means that not only can you benchmark these tools, but you can also uh, run them relatively easily in parallel. So, what do we think? Uh, <laughs> the GIF started at slightly the wrong time. Untrusted builds should be great, but they are not realistically quite ready. There are attacks against everything that's not container builder, and even container builder we are trusting someone else's security model, which is great, but of course it doesn't work for on-prem builds, as I say. And in the wild, the kind of isolation we're talking about, for this kind of isolation, people are using virtual machines around fully untrusted builds. By fully untrusted, I mean we are pulling data from the internet, we are allowing users to supply executable code that we run inside our estate. Currently, VMs are used as the ultimate security boundary around that which is fine. No project has fully pursued the untrusted dream, but I expect us to get closer to Utopia in 2019. What else will happen in 2019? Well, rootless run C is already here. User Nessies is an unprivileged Kubernetes in a user namespace, again from Akihiro. 
ShiftFS may well land soon, courtesy of the Canonical team. The container versus hypervisor battles continue in data centers throughout the lands. Building containers in hypervisors seems a sensible compromise at this point when we don't trust them. And heresy unikernels are still here, although they don't provide the most obvious container build context at this time. I suspect it's going to be a good year. Um, happily, I have some extra bits to add to the talk. Uh, we have just open sourced KubeSec version 2, which is static analysis and security risk scoring for container, uh, for Kubernetes resource manifests. Uh, there is a hosted version, there's an open source version, there's a Kubernetes admission controller, there is a kube control plugin. Um, please kick the tires, tell us what you think. It passes the same acceptance test suite as version 1, but it has become more stringent. Um, it outputs something like this, so it's just blobs of JSON. In, uh, in an array, giving you essentially per, um, per document analysis. Uh, and also, uh, Control Plane are releasing a number of DevSecOps flavored tools. These are essentially pipeline scripts and uh, DevSecOps as a service. If that's something that interests you, please swing past the booth, uh, give me a grilling. And with that, here are all the links, and thank you for your attention. I think we have a minute or two for questions if anybody has anything burning. Great talk, thank you. Uh, besides virtual machines, what should we actually be using in a Kubernetes environment to build the images? You know, uh, the bread and butter <laughs> solution that just works. Um, the uh, the Canico project is probably the, the best adopted and the most proliferated it is designed as being Kubernetes native, um, and they've patched these Kubernetes uh, um, proc mask uh, features into security context, so you can explicitly set a pod security policy that allows you to run Canico. Um, that, that, is, that is a really nice solution. There are these, you do still have roots nested down inside there, so everything comes as a compromise, um, but I, I really like Canico. The, the new Docker Builder stuff is also very good. Um, Cloud Build is also awesome. So, kind of horses for courses, but uh, yeah, th those would be my three areas of interest. Any more for any more? Thank you for this talk. Um, I, uh, do you, have you heard about the Nix package manager? About Nix, did you Nix say? Nix package manager. Yes, people love to ask about yeah. Nix. Um, <laughs> because uh, it's, it's made to be reproducible at some point. Yeah, so, um, so, so Nix uh, essentially prevents you from getting into dependency hell by being uh, f fully deterministic, I guess, is probably the way to describe it. Um, I do not know enough about it, but when I've asked people, then uh, I believe you have a, a, an entirely separate operating system chain down to uh, down to your sort of kernel build. So I don't know at what point it would integrate with all this tooling. Um, yeah. Maybe you can tell me. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it provides some kind of uh, something called Docker tools that, uh, so you can just provide your, your chain of uh, dependencies and say put it in a container and, uh, and it's run, uh, it runs that with uh, on, only only we using Nix with uh, the the Nix builder, so it's rootless. It's uh, it kind of fits in your yeah hermetic did, did, rootless and reproducible. Can, can I get a show of hands? Does anybody actually use Nix? Okay, uh, I, I'd love to talk to you guys and just yeah. understand more about this afterwards. Then, <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more? I guess we've got time for one more. Okay, thank you very much, everybody.